about management of alcohol withdrawal because it can be quite complex. It can be really challenging and I think this is Ooh. one of those areas that can be really frustrating because there's not yes. a lot of data to guide us. Oh. Uh, and I think everybody sort of feels like they know the best way to do this. Hi, I'm Nicole Kupchik and this is 10 Minute Tidbits. Today, I'm here with Nick Johnson. And we are going to chat about alcohol withdrawal. Yeah, I just happen to work at a center of excellence on this topic. Uh, so Everybody this feels of, like this they is do. one of my favorites. <laughs> so I love that center of excellence. Do they have an award for that? I'm sure. <laughs> love it. So anyway, all right, so let's talk about alcohol withdrawal. How many of you have ever had to do the CWA scale or give medication? <laughs> Sorry. So let's talk about management of alcohol withdrawal because it can be quite complex. It can be really challenging and I think this Ooh. is one of those areas that can be really frustrating because there's not yes. a lot of data to guide us. Uh, oh. And I think everybody sort of feels like they know the best way to do this. Yes. Okay, so kind of baseline. A lot of people feel foundationally you should have some sort of a benzodiazepine. Mm -hmm. How, what are your opinions on that? I think that that's probably true, though there are some new protocols and, and approaches that are emerging using other drugs as monotherapy. Yeah. But I think probably the foundation of alcohol withdrawal, based on the limited data that we have on this topic, is still the benzodiazepine. Yeah, and I've been seeing more and more benzo sparing protocols mm -hmm. popping up where you do use benzos, namely Ativan or uh, Valium, as a um, kind of a foundation, but might use a kind of a poly drug approach to managing alcohol withdrawal. Uh, all right, so let's talk about some go-tos. Yeah, so I think approach-wise, I generally kind of fall into one of two camps. One approach is your symptom triggered approach where you wait for the patient to develop some signs or symptoms of alcohol withdrawal and you either use a scale like Siwa or you use your Gestalt to give benzos or some other drug in response to that scale. The other option is the aggress aggressive approach and this is for your professional alcohol withdrawers, the people who come in. Do you know with, any of those? <laughs> I know a, no, a couple. The people who come in with alcohol levels in the 300s but are already starting to show signs of withdrawal and you know that it's only going to get worse from there. Um, there are some kind of protocols in the literature, probably the most famous one is the Bellevue protocol, where you really aggressively load people on the front end with longer acting medications and let those medications sort of auto taper over time. So I think the first category is great for those patients who are in the hospital for something unrelated to their alcohol withdrawal. They broke their ankle um, and they developed some mild to moderate withdrawal in the hospital. The second type of strategy probably works best for people who are really professionals and are, and are ICU level alcohol withdrawal if they come into the hospital. Okay, let's talk about medications. Sure. All right, so benzos. Uh, I, I, I personally have seen most protocols will use either lorazepam or diazepam. Right. Any, any place for midazolam? I think midazolam is not the ideal agent yeah. for alcohol withdrawal just because it's so short acting. Uh, between the other two, a lot of the pharmacists who work in our neuro ICU really like lorazepam because apparently it crosses the blood brain barrier mm -hmm. better. Uh, a lot of us who work in the ED like diazepam because it's long acting and has active metabolites, so you don't have to redose people quite as often. If their liver doesn't work, that's a problem, so you just need to be careful in patients who have end stage liver disease or bad cirrhosis. Um, but it's a nice drug yeah. because of that auto tapering property with all those active metabolites. Okay, so let's talk about the hot med on the street right now. So phenobarbital. Phenobarb. Yeah. Phenobarb is so name? hot right now, right now. Yeah. <laughs> the coat goes around, comes around, yeah. right? Okay. Yeah, so I think phenobarb is a, is a hot topic right now. Uh, originally kind of came back on the scene as an adjunct for alcohol yeah. withdrawal as a benzo sparing agent where you give relatively small doses like in the 130 milligram range to try to decrease your total uh, benzodiazepine dose. It potentiates GABA receptor binding by benzos, so it helps to bind more tightly to those receptors. Um, and is a really great agent to be able to decrease your cumulative benzo dose. And it turns out that when you give those together, uh, they're not super synergistic in terms of things like respiratory depression and other things we worry about, but it does allow you to decrease your overall benzo dose. Okay, and it's got anti-convulsant properties as yeah, well. It's a so bonus. Yeah. 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 If you've got somebody now, how well, how do you feel about somebody that's going um, has had DTs in the past with seizures in the past? Would you just load them with an anti-convulsant, or how, what are your feelings on that? Not necessarily. Um, a lot of the 
more traditional anticonvulsants like phenytoin, their role in alcohol withdrawal is a little bit less clear. Mm -hmm. um, so those patients, I think, just being extra vigilant and aggressive about loading them on the front end with either benzos or another GABA agent like a, a phenobarbital is a, is a fine way to go. Okay. Uh, one other thing that's coming on the scene now is phenobarb monotherapy. Uh, and there are a few small studies of this, uh, okay. one from UCLA that actually showed that if you use a really aggressive phenobarb load up front, and we're talking in the 15 to 20 mg per kg range, so kind of what you would give it's a decent uh, dose. A pretty decent dose. <laughs> um, you can actually decrease the incidence of ICU admission uh, with oh. no change in things like intubation or hypotension or other adverse events. These are all really small studies, and this is kind of hypothesis generating, but there are a number of institutions that have adopted protocols like this um, and use them with a lot of success and not a lot of safety issues that I've heard about so far. So okay. something else you might see out there. All right, so tell me your thoughts on dexmedetomidine. Yeah, dexmedetomidine is another one of those kind of hot new agents in a lot of areas. I think it's actually an awesome drug for ICU sedation in the right patient. Um, there are some studies showing that it can be used as an adjunct therapy in alcohol withdrawal, but not as a primary therapy. So it shouldn't be our number one go-to, but if you're given a lot of benzos and patients are still pulling out lines and tubes and having a lot of problems with the agitation component of alcohol withdrawal, I think it's a great drug. Yeah, and I, the protocols I've used have, um, it's been using lorazepam as your foundation with dex, um, added and I, I found we used a heck of a lot less lorazepam yeah, yeah. Uh, with it. You know, I mean, you're, I think your one major limiting factor though is bradycardia. Absolutely. With it, um, but yeah. yeah, but I mean, I, I'll never forget because I switched hospitals, went to another hospital where we used Dex lorazepam combo, mm -hmm. and then came back where we were using lorazepam monotherapy. Let's just be honest. This yeah. is a few years ago though, but I'll never forget walking into the unit and see having we had a patient on 42 milligrams an hour of lorazepam. It's like, come on, this isn't working. No. Yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> I think the one thing to be careful about with DEX is that sometimes it can mask the autonomic stuff. Oh, so okay. your tachycardia gets better, the hypertension gets better, um, but it doesn't necessarily fix the seizure threshold issues. So mm, you yeah. can get a little bit complacent sometimes because the, the vital signs look really nice, but the patient's actually still mm. having severe withdrawal and the seizure ri risk hasn't gone away. Yeah, that's, I think that's a really good point. That just don't forget your lorazepam or, or benzo or some what other agent, whatever agent you're yeah. using. Okay, what about Librium? I think Librium is a, a fine agent to use for patients that are thinking about going home or maybe on the acute care uh, setting where the alcohol withdrawal is kind of in the mild to moderate range. Okay. Not something I use in, typically in my ICU yeah. patients, but I use it a lot in the ED for patients who have mild withdrawal and maybe you're going to be going to detox or going home. Okay. All right. Any other medications you would toss at a patient if needed? I think if you're going really far down the algorithm, you know, when you get to the point of intubation, propofol is a really yeah. nice GABA agent okay. that you can use in an intubated patient um, that has good affinity for the GABA receptors and treats alcohol withdrawal and reduces the risk of seizures. And so I think that's another good one to have on the list. Um, one other weird one that's coming out on the scene is ketamine. Uh, Okay, ketamine yeah, for everyone. Everything. You yeah. get ketamine. Everyone gets ketamine, Headaches, right? Depression, pain, <laughs> sedation, <laughs> you name it. Now add alcohol withdrawal to the list. Uh, oh god! <laughs> I will admit the data for ketamine and alcohol withdrawal are, are not the strongest yet. There's not okay. a lot out there, uh, mm -hmm. but there are some reports of it uh, being a useful adjunct for alcohol withdrawal, yeah. and some people who really advocate for its use. So yeah, the hot thing is for seizures yeah, right now. Yeah. Ketamine for seizures. So yeah. Um, yeah, I swear it's like ketamine for is the answer to everything. It is. I did. Yeah. We did a. Um, at YouTube on uh, patients waking up during cardiac arrest, mm -hmm. you know, with good CPR, and a lot of protocols have it's ketamine. ketamine. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> this guy uh, remembers his whole team working on him doing CPR, yeah. and then he remembers something going up his arm, and then he floated above the team and watched them work on it. That's crazy. But he didn't have PTSD. That's amazing. Which is amazing, yeah. you know, which is kind of an amazing thing. Yeah, so anyway. absolutely. All right. So um, and then other so what are what other things do you, would you say uh, would be good for nurses to really think about at the bedside with an, a, a chronic alcoholic? I mean, obviously liver dysfunction, altering meds, but what about vitamin deficiencies? Yeah, I think definitely vitamin deficiencies and also just other comorbidities that run with yeah. alcoholism mm -hmm. uh, and alcohol use are really important. Um, so pretty much everybody who's admitted to the hospital with alcohol use disorder should be on thiamine of some sort. Yes, yeah. uh, it's an opportunity to repeat their, replete their thiamine stores even if they're not really, really deficient. Uh, but that's an easy one. Oral thiamine's cheap. There's no reason not to give it. Uh, and then I think being careful with medications and dosing in patients with liver dysfunction, especially with severe liver dysfunction or end-stage liver disease, a lot of these benzos will accumulate in patients yeah. with severe liver disease. So it's just something to be careful about. Yeah. Um, 
and you know there are a lot of other things that run with alcohol use disorder trauma being a big one so thinking about whether you know your patients at risk for falling and having other injuries in the hospital or they could have had injuries before yeah. they came in um, and then thinking about your discharge plan and what's going to happen after all this yeah yeah and I, I think that's really tough now okay let me just okay one last thing I want to ask about so I will never forget it was three Christmases ago mm -hmm. I come into work and um, I've got this guy who had a GI bleed um, and he was a super cool guy, but he was kind of an under the cover, like kind of on the DL alcoholic. Mm -hmm. And I said to the doc that was on call, I said, can, cause he wasn't there for alcoholism or anything, but, mm -hmm. but I, I knew like, I, cause you always say like, do you not, I don't ever say, do you drink a six pack a day? I say, do you drink a 24 pack a day? Right. And then they'll admit to 18, right? right? Yeah. So anyway, so we had this guy, super nice, awesome guy, there for GI bleed for um, from NSAID use, mm -hmm. actually. And um, and I said to the doc, I said, can we just give him alcohol? And he was like, no way. So guess what happens? He goes into full-on DTs yeah. and ends up yeah. in the hospital another week. So what are your thoughts on just letting patients drink? You know, it's when I first started my current job, it's something that we used to do in the neuro ICU for patients with brain injury. Okay. Um, I think that there are a couple of downsides. The biggest downside in my mind is feasibility. Usually if patients are at the point where they need to drink that much while they're in the hospital, keeping up when, when they're sick or injured is actually impossible. So if they drink 24 okay. beers a day, you're never going to get 24 beers a day yeah. in, in someone who's got a brain injury. It's just not going to happen. Yeah, that's true. Okay. And then, you know, there's kind of the ethical issue and how you feel about giving people alcohol when you know it's kind of damaging their body imminently. I think that's uh, more of a personal decision and it's a harder, harder decision to make medically. Yeah. Um, but that's obviously the other concern is you're kind of contributing to ongoing damage. Um, but it's, yeah. you know, it, it works. It's just if, uh, a matter of whether you can keep up or not and whether you feel good about it. Yeah. And then how many of you have gotten the orders for one beer with every meal and you're like, <laughs> yeah, right. That's, that's not, it's not, not <laughs> going to happen. Do it. Yeah. That's not going to do it. Yeah. yeah but we've, right. we've pretty much moved away from it for that reason. Like it's just not feasible to keep up with okay. the folks who need it. Yeah. yeah. And then what, what if it's just a little something just to keep the edge off? Do, are they, are you doing that at I'm, all? Not, not really. Not really. I mean, we yeah. usually use benzos instead. We've got a little bit more control over dose that way and it's, yeah. it's a little safer overall and we're not contributing to, you know, watching their liver, their ulcer, yeah. or their alcohol gastritis worsen in front yeah. of us. All right. Anyway. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, really interesting. I'd say stay tuned. It's kind of exciting to see new data being published on the management of um, alcohol withdrawal because we, uh, we see it no matter what hospital we're at. What clinic? I mean, we see this everywhere, right? It's, oh, um, absolutely. It's yeah. one of the most common things, and it's surprising that there's really not much research out there. Yeah, it's crazy. So, all right. Well, I'm Nicole Kopchik. This is Nick Johnson. And this is 10 Minute Tidbits.